Uh, good afternoon, and, and thank all of you for coming. We have a very uh, special guest today, uh, John Schiller from the National Cancer Institute, and um, he's going to tell us about uh, the, the whole story of HPV and vaccination from a historical perspective, and it's going to be uh, fascinating. So I don't need to dive that much into his history. I think you got your bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin. I remember seeing that somewhere and went to the University of Washington in microbiology. Of course, it was when his career and life journey led him to the National Cancer Institute in this fabulous partnership with Doug Lowy that things really took off. And, and uh, they were beginning to build tools, I think originally with bovine papillomavirus, um, but they had come across this notion of building virus-like particles as a fabulous platform for vaccine construction for human papillomaviruses, and they could elicit responses to specific types using this platform. Well, as we understood more and more clearly just how responsible for various different cancers that HPVs were, this vaccine becomes uh, a great uh, molecular biology achievement, but it's got to be one of the greatest public health opportunities uh, that's been created to really take on a whole series of diseases on a global scale probably didn't think of yourself as a population scale thinker when you started this, but it's one of the greatest at all of cancer medicine. So without any more, thank you for coming, John, and welcome. Well, thanks for the nice introduction, and thanks for you all being here. Can't believe that they had to bribe you all with sandwiches just to be here, so I don't know whether, you know, hopefully the sandwiches are good, and the, the talk isn't too bad either. So what I'm going to tell you about today is on this slide, the journey towards elimination of cervical cancer. Elimination is a strong word, isn't it? But we actually, what I hopefully can show you today is we believe that we have the tools in hand where this can happen. Probably the first cancer we can eliminate. But just to make it clear, by elimination, that's not the same as eradication. Eradication means it's, it's off the face of the earth, never coming back. Elimination means that it ceases to be a significant public health problem. And we think that we have the tools to do that. So basically, the essential tools that we have that I'll be going over today, and I'm gonna take a broader view than just vaccines, is that we have the knowledge that virtually all cervical cancers are caused by oncogenic HPV vaccines. We have vaccines for primary prevention of HPV infection, and we have screening for secondary prevention by diagnosis, for diagnosis and treatment of pre-malignant lesions. And just to make it clear that vaccines and screening are really complementary. We shouldn't be thinking about screening or vaccines, we should be thinking both and. and. Because they target, again, different populations. The vaccine is meant to prevent this initial rise, this initial peak in HPV infection and so is, is targeted for adolescents, pre-adolescents, before they become sexually active. Whereas screening identifies precancerous lesions for excision before they go on to cancer. So really, we think that this is perhaps the only vaccine where we really have the major tools to eliminate this cancer. And so what I'll be going over today is what were the critical discoveries, how were they made, and how will we use them to fulfill the, prob the promise of these technologies? And really, again, it will be a convergence of three lines of discovery. First, the understanding that HPV is a central cause of cervical cancer, that, and then employing both virus-independent and virus-dependent screening technologies to treat the, the lesions in adult women, and then the, the thing that we were most involved with, the development of safe and effective vaccine to prevent oncogenic HPV infections in young people. So as I'll go on, I'll, I'll really tell you some, some of the history that preceded what I was working on, some things in parallel, and then some of the things that my group and Doug Lowy's group was working on, in which case I'll hopefully give you a couple of anecdotal um, stories that, that will prove interesting. So the worldwide distribution of cancer we really tend to focus on cervical cancer, and it's clear why here, because almost all cervical cancers are associated with HPV, and there's about a half a million cases a year and about 250,000 um, deaths due to HPV-associated cancer. But there's also these other cancers as well that are HPV-associated, although the attributable fraction is less. Overall, about 5% of all cancers are caused by HPV infection, we believe, currently. 
And just to point out that although we concentrate on cervical cancer in women, there are cancers in men that are caused by HPV, particularly anal cancer, oral pharyngeal cancer, and penile cancer. So the first question is what, is what causes cervical cancer? What is the history of cancer causation um, with regard to cervical cancer? Well, the first thing in terms of causation was an interesting observation made by Rigotti Stern in 1882. And he made an astute connection between intercourse and cervical cancer. And what he, he realized is that cervical cancer was really rare in nuns but it was actually much more common in sexually active women, particularly sex workers. Now he actually got this, the etiology a little wrong because he wasn't thinking about sexually transmitted diseases. He attributed to the fact that, that women who were sexually active were giving birth to children and exercising the tissue, and that somehow that was protective from getting cervical cancer. But later when we accepted the germ theory of diseases, attention started to focus more on sexually transmitted infections and how they may be associated. And this led to a lot of work to try to figure out the sexually transmitted disease that was causing cervical cancer, because clearly it was associated with sexual activity. And a virus that was um, in vogue back in the 60s and 70s was genital herpes virus infection. And this was actually the cover of Time Magazine in 1982, where they said, be careful of herpes. It not only gives you genital herpes, but we think it might give you cervical cancer. Now, to cut a long story short, herpes viruses don't cause cervical cancer. And perhaps the most telling stories, uh, studies were done by Vladimir Vonka and his colleagues, where they did prospective seroepidemiological studies. And they showed that if a woman is HPV, uh, uh, herpes virus positive for antibodies to the virus, or she isn't, you have an equal probability of getting cervical cancer. So the reason why there was a partial link between herpes viruses and cervical cancer is because it's also a sexually transmitted disease. And so now let's go over the data that went into our conclusion that HPVs are the central cause of cervical cancer. And the story really starts with animal models, as many places in virology. And the first idea that, that needle plasia of any kind can be induced by papillomaviruses uh, was demonstrating that papillomas in, in rabbits could be caused by filterable transmissible agents, and that on occasion they could progress to cervical carcinoma and that the application of co-carcinogen could potentiate carcinogenesis. And the guys who did this was Richard Shope and Peyton Rouse. And this shows the rabbit model where these rabbits get these really quite profound hyperproliferative diseases. And uh, here's, here's Richard Shope who demonstrated that this was caused by a virus infection because the infection could be passed through a filter. This is a picture of, of Peyton Rouse, who really establishes for the first time the idea of co-carcinogen. So what he did is, is, in these rabbits, he infected them with extracts from the warts, which had the papillomaviruses, although at the time they didn't really understand really what the virus was about. And then he also then painted the lesions with coal tar, and he greatly um, potentiated carcinogenic progression by doing that. So these papillomavirus infections and progression to cancer was the first incidence that a virus could cause a solid tumor in a mammal. Rouse actually also um, did some um, studies of a virus called Rouse psychoma virus, which was, which was the first virus to be shown to be oncogenic in chickens. So this led to uh, development of, of several other animal papillomavirus models where people saw warts, they, they ground them up, they, they scarified the skin and induced papillomas. And this is just a list of some rabbit oral papilloma, canine oral papilloma, so these were mucosal infections, and bovine papillomavirus type 1, which as I'll talk about a little bit later, was one that, that Doug and I actually worked on quite a bit because it induces what's called fiber papillomas, epithelial component proliferation, but also a dermal component. And if you take care, if you take fibroblasts in culture and put the virus in, they get what's called a transformed phenotype, they pile up. But the thing about these models is that none of them induce cancers. They did induce benign proliferation. 
So the association between cancer was, was relatively um, weak. In the 80s, this is 1987, when, when um, Bill Jarrett and company uh, and colleagues published that another type of BPV called BPV4, which infects the elementary canal in cattle, could cause cancers, but it only really caused cancers when the, when the animals were eating bracken fur, which has immunosuppressive and co-carcinogenic activities. So this was an example where, again, in response to environmental stresses, you could get cancer from a papillomavirus. So what about HPV's human papillomaviruses and cancer? Well, the viral etiology of genital and non-genital warts was established by the 20s. We knew that they were caused by an infectious agent, but these papillomas did not pro progress to cancer, and they still don't progress for cancer. If you have a common hand and foot wart or a genital wart, the chances of malignant progression are extremely rare. But one thing that wasn't appreciated during this time um, up until the 70s is the great diversity of the HPV types. And their biology was, was largely unstudied because there was no permissive culture, culture, tissue culture system in which to grow these viruses. And so in comparison to many other viruses, the studies really lagged. But then came the era of molecular biology, which started in the late 70s and, and early um, 80s, in which initially there was nucleic acid hybridization techniques um, which was used to distinguish among the various types. And it was determined that there were very specific distinct types that caused cutaneous warts, even differences between hand and foot warts. Other types caused most genital warts. And then there was another group of viruses that only caused visible lesions uh, in people with a rare genetic disease called epidermodysplays or verrucoformis. And Subsequent to that, in the early 80s, some of these genomes were sequenced, and so we actually knew what the open reading frames of the virus was and start to do molecular characterization of the individual proteins. So the initial breakthrough in the association of HPV with cervical cancer was the identification by Harold Orth and Stefania Jablonska and their colleagues that some of these EV lesions in these um, people with this genetic predisposition could progress onto squamous cell carcinoma in two of the specific types that they isolated, type 5 and type 8, and they identified these first in the lesions, um, were found in the squamous cell carcinomas. Now, this didn't go too far initially because this was considered quite an anomaly because it was only happening in a very small group of patients, perhaps a few hundred around the world. And so the public health implications of this was, uh, was not well appreciated. The first link between cervical dysplasias, and cervical premalignant um, disease, and HPVs was the finding by Alex Mizell that there's morphologic changes in cervical dysplasias, the premalignant lesions that can go on to cancer, that resembled what's called coelocytic coelocytic atypia in genital warts. And so what this, you see is these nuclei, these vacuolated nuclei with this um, heavily staining patch in the middle. He saw that this was in genital warts, which was known to be caused by HPV. So he surmised, aha, maybe these lesions that we see in the cervix that we think are the precursors for cervical cancer are also caused by HPV. But when he looked at it, most of these didn't have the viruses that had been previously identified. And the big breakthrough came in the early 80s, 1983, when Harold Zerhausen and his colleagues at the German Cancer Research Center identified a new virus in cervical cancer. And he said he found that 50% of cervical cancers have this virus in them at the time of the, the cancer is diagnosed. Uh, the next year, he, he, and this virus was called HPV-16. Year, a year or two later, he also identified HPV-18, uh, which is in 80%, uh, 20 percent of cervical cancer. So between these two, 70 percent of cervical cancer were associated with those types. Now, I actually, in terms of my career, this was a watershed for my career because the second lecture that I, I went to after joining the NCI and joining Doug Lowy's lab to study bovine papillomavirus as a model for cellular transformation, 
is to go to a lecture by Harold Zerhausen. He was going out around publicizing that they found these new HPV types that were associated with cancer. So suddenly I went from studying a molecular model for how cancer can occur to a virus that was associated with cancer. Now, naively, I thought that this meant that, the HPVs caught, that these HPVs caused cancer. But in retrospect, there's actually a lot that goes into showing an association is, means a causal inference, okay? Because one can imagine that maybe the cancers occur and they're just very good places for the virus to infect, okay? But they're not causing the cancer. So during the 80s and 90s, the big question is to really establish beyond a reasonable doubt that these viruses that were infecting the cancer were causing the cancer and not passive passengers. So establishing biological plausibility between the causal relation with cervical cancer. Well, one of the things is, was to establish that two of the genes, E6 and E7, were selectively retained and expressed in cervical cancer cells. And again, Harold Zerhausen's group initially did this. So it's not just the virus is there, but it's actually expressing some of its gene products. And then our lab and other laboratories showed that these particular genes could act like oncogenes, that they had very powerful activities. And one paper that we published is that if you take this E6 and E7 and express them in normal keratinocytes, you reproducibly get immortalization. It doesn't initially make them carcinogenic, and you have to add other oncogenes to make them carcinogenic, but it does immortalize them. And the other thing that it does very rapidly is it inducing genetic instability. I can tell you we were shocked when we, we put E6 and E7 into these normal keratinocytes, which would have normal complements of chromosomes, and within a few passages, the chromosomes were just all over the place. The cells were totally aneuploid. We could hardly figure out how many chromosomes they had and where they came from because they were so mixed up. So you can imagine how this type of activity could be on the causal pathway for cancer. And the other thing that they did, it was started to understand, is that they were doing these activities um, and were oncogenes because they interacted with key nodal points in cellular control of, of proliferation. And particularly, they interacted with the P53 and the PRB tumor suppressor genes. Now, these are genes that are often mutated in cancers that are not virally associated. And at the time, we were very struck that this was actually that they interact with these genes, came secondarily to studies in cultured cells that a polyomavirus, SV40, and adenovirus type 5 actually had gene products that inactivated the same to tumor suppressor genes. So that was all very interesting, but it was, in terms of cancer causation, it kind of made sense, except for the fact that human polyomaviruses and adenoviruses, although they were common in humans, they did not, they were not associated with human cancers. Now, adenoviruses still are not associated with human cancers, but there is one polyomavirus, Merkel cell polyomavirus, that has later been shown to be associated with this rare cancer, Merkel cell polyoma. Uh, Merkel cell carcinoma. Now, in addition to what the laboratory studies that I briefly described, there was a whole set of, of epidemiological and clini clinical studies in the 80s and the 90s that supported the causal relationship between HPV and cervical cancer. And to cut a long story short, we could understand the progression from normal epithelium at the cervix to cancer from the point of view of HPV. So, Normal epithelium, when it gets infected with HPV, um, you get what's called cervical intraepithelial grade 1, which is just a virus-producing lesion. And this is, or it's called low-grade squamous, low squamous intraepithelial lesions by cytology. And I'll go into a minute. This is, this is what's diagnosed in a pap screen. And then as you get progression, you tend to get higher levels of E6 and E7 and oftentimes vir viral integration and induction of a, of a frank cancer. So all these steps are associated with HPV infection. And it was actually very important when I talk about the vaccine a little bit later to tell you that we absolutely needed to understand this process in order for us to do the vaccine trials. Because we wanted a vaccine that would be licensed for prevention of cancer, 
but we couldn't let the women get cancer in the studies because we identified the premalignant lesions for removal and because it would have been a 20 or 30 year trial because that's how long it takes from initial infection to go on to cancer. And so we were able to use these intermediate um, and high grade dysplasias as the endpoints in the clinical trial only because we understood this natural history of disease. And one, th one important observation in terms of causality is that the, the risk has to precede the disease, okay? So if HPV was a passage care, passive, um, passenger in the cancers, what you'd expect is that it would be a late event. But it turns out it's a very early initiating event. And this has been shown here later in some later data that if you look at someone who is detected, has a normal cervix, and is detected with an HPV infection, what's their absolute risk of getting high-grade um, cervical dysplasia, pre-cancer? And you can see it's quite stunning that it's almost 15% if you have HPV 16, somewhat less here. But if you're HPV negative, you have almost no chance in the next 15 years of, de of developing high-grade precancer at the cervix. So clearly HPV is an initiating event. And so these kind of studies have led us to really understand the natural history as follows. So after initial infection, within a year, you can, if you can continue to get infection, you get SYN1. And both asymptomatic and SYN1 generally clear, 90% of them clear within two years. And then you're, you're not at risk of getting cervical cancer. But in, in, in relatively infrequently, it continues to persist for years, developing intermediate and high-grade dysplasia, and eventually can develop into cervical cancer. And these two actually quite rarely um, spontaneously regress. And if you look at the association between cervical cancer and HPV, it's the strongest association with a specific risk factor in a cancer. These types of, of odds ratios or risk ratios are completely unheard of in cancer. So the association between smoking and cancer is about 10, okay? So if you smoke, you have a tenfold higher risk of having, getting lung cancer than if you don't. For HPV, if you have HPV infection, your increased risk is 100-fold or to 500-fold. Basically, if you don't have HPV infection, you're not going to get cervical cancer. And th this basically ended up to, with this remarkable conclusion that HPV is a necessary cause of cervical cancer. It's the first time and the only time, I believe, that a single etiological agent is considered necessary for a specific cancer. Basically, greater than 99% of cancers cervical cancers in careful studies where they actually really have um, tumor tissue and good DNA have HPVs inside them. So let's turn to screening. So screening, in in interestingly enough, has been going on for a lot of years. It started in the 20s. It was completely divorced from our understanding of virology and the association with HPV. It was based upon morphological changes in, in these cervical cells that were collected in the cervical os by pap smear. And in, in the United States, although it was first introduced in the 20s, it wasn't actually started to be used in the United States till the 50s, and really led to a dramatic reduction in cervical cancer. And this is Dr. Pap Papa Nicolau right here, who worked in the United States, a man of a Greek origin. And this is basically what a pap smear looks like. So these are normal squames um, that should, what it should look like when you scrape the cervix and then put it on a, on a, a slide. And these cells here are, have small nuclei dividing cells, which is an indication that you have an abnormality. And so women with these sorts of abnormalities, they would get biopsy using col col a colposcopy-directed biopsy, and if it looked like it was a high-grade lesion, they would then get um, a blade of treatment. But it really is quite dramatic if you look at the incidence of cervical cancer, again, decreased by 80%. But one of the problems is that this was good, this pap screening has been great at reducing squamous carcinoma, but not adenocarcinoma. And the reason for this is because when you do these scrapes, you tend not to collect um, 
cells in the, ad, in the endocervical canal where the adenocarcinomas arise. And so you can see in the bottom that there really hasn't been any change with pap screening in the incidence of adenocarcinoma. If anything, it's been going up a little bit, especially in whites. So basically, the, the knowledge that HPV is a central cause of cervical cancer allows us to use virologic-based screening rather than morphologic-based screening. So although pap screening works, it's expensive, requires specialized expertise in cytology, and in terms of the developing world where most cervical cancers occur, it hasn't been able to be readily adopted. Now, therefore, we're turning to HPV-based screening, which is more sensitive, it's better at detecting adenocarcinoma or adenoprecarcinoma. It has a higher positive and, and predictive um, value in terms of, of identifying by, in a single test whether your risk of cancer, what, what your risk of cancer is. And it's much more readily exported to low resource settings. So this is just an example that if you have a single test by a pap smear or a single test um, by DNA, retrospectively, what's your chance of getting cervical cancer? And you can see that, that it's reduced markedly with HPV DNA, and especially for adenocarcinoma. It does a little bit better for squamous carcinoma. So in comparison to the standard pap screening, doing HPV DNA um, screening, and it depends a little bit on the test, you gain sensitivity of 30 to 40 percent, but you lose a little specificity because there's a lot of people who have lesions, uh, who have infections, but they don't have these lesions. This is especially true among younger women. And because of that, it's not recommended that under 30 you get screened by HPV DNA because too many of the, of the women will have spontaneous regression. And it has much higher reproducibility, reproducibility and can be automated. And so because HPV DNA test has higher negative predictability, a predictive value. By that I mean if you test negative for HPV DNA today, the chances of you getting cervical cancer in the next 10, year, 10 years is really low. If you test negative by cytology, you have a substantially higher risk because there's more chance that we miss the abnormal cells than we miss the HPV infection. And so because of this, we've now gone to, to screening every five years if you use HPV DNA test and again, in women over 30, versus cytology, where you have testing every three years. Some women are, are, are still being tested every year. And so the development of these HPV DNA tests is actually a relatively recent development in the history um, of cancer prevention. So the first test was, was, was uh, approved in 2003, and there's a whole cottage industry of new tests being developed. And it's unlikely that any of these tests is going to be the ultimate test. For instance, one of the new ideas is to do high throughput sequencing. So with barcodes, you can have a different barcode and test 1,000 or 10,000 samples at once and can do it at a much lower cost than the current types of samples. So this is a moving target and you can expect that in the future there will continue to be improvements in DNA screening and translation to low resource settings. But one of the problems with DNA-based testing is that it's, it's too sensitive because many women who are HPV DNA positive don't have lesions that you want to treat. And so most, most of them are char characterized as negative for intraepithelial lesions or malignancies. And so what we need is a triage test, an ancillary test, that's based upon the molecular understanding of HPV-induced disease to separate those women who lesions are likely to go away, or the infections are likely to go away, from those that are really on the pathway to precancer and cancer. And I'm not going to go into it, but currently there's a whole lot of different things, um, both based upon cellular changes, such as P16, or viral changes, such as DNA integration or expression of the mRNA, that people are trying to develop to basically triage the women who test HPV DNA positive, so you don't have to refer as many to, to further follow-up. So basically what we've gone is from, from, 2000, from 1928 to a, a, a completely morphology-based screening program, which was quite effective, to HPV DNA. And, and presumably the efficiency of HPV DNA testing will increase in the future by developing more effective triage biomarkers. So now let's turn to the HPV vaccines which is what's most dear to my heart, and it's what we've been most involved in.
So surprisingly, Richard Chope actually developed the first effective papillomavirus vaccine way back in 1936. So what he did is he took real viruses and either inactivated them a little bit and he injected them intraperitoneally. Now the virus doesn't grow if you inject intraperitoneally, it only grow in a stratified squamous epithelia. And what he found is that if you did this in, with the rabbits with these ex, extracts that had these rabbit papillomaviruses in, the rabbits were protected from subsequent challenge. So this makes it seem like the vaccine should be easy to do. But the problem was is that there was no way to grow the virus in culture, okay? And viruses like HPV-16 don't tend to make a whole lot of virus. There's no place to get enough virus to make, for instance, an inactivated virus vaccine. And it was known, again, that in other animal models subsequently, that if you did intramuscular injection of virions, which again doesn't induce a productive infection, um, then you, get, you got protection from, from subsequent challenge with the same virus. But if you denatured the L1, for instance, if you made L1 in an E. coli system and isolated from inclusion bodies, so it was denatured, or tried to use individual E7 peptides or polypeptides, you basically got no protection from experimental challenge or no generation of in vitro neutralizing antibodies in the few cases where we had those types of assays. And so what we thought at this time, at the beginning of 90s, is that what we need is confirmationally correct L1. It's got to be in the confirmation that it's found in the real virions. We can't generate real virions, so let's try to do the next best thing. Let's make what's called virus-like particles that, that morphologically resemble a virus and see if that could work. Now, just to point out that when, when Doug and I, Doug Lowe and I started this, we weren't the most experienced in this type of research. So we had absolutely no experience in vaccines, no experience in immunology, no experience in translational research, no experience in, in the very structural proteins, which would be making up these virus-like particles. Uh, we did have some experience in basic papillomavirus biology. Up, at this, up until this point, we were studying how the viruses cause cancer, not how to prevent the infections that lead to cancer. But it was fortunate that we are in the intramural program of the National Cancer Institute so we have basically retrospective review. So we do whatever the hell we want for four years and then we have to justify it to an outside committee of people like Richard or somebody coming in to, to evaluate it. And so we didn't have to ask permission to do these experiments because if we had, they would say, you know, you're not going to get money for that because you have no expertise whatsoever. So it was a real advantage when, when we started this. So the idea of making virus-like particles um, did not come out of thin air. And it's like everything else in science, in biomedical science, there are precedents. And in this case, the reason we thought we could maybe make a virus-like particle is because people had been starting to make virus-like particle for other DNA viruses with icosahedral symmetry in their, in their structures. And the first example of this was from Bob Garcia, who late, later also started working on HPV where he showed if you make this one major capsid protein of a, of, of, a of a polyomavirus, BP1, express it in E. coli, you could get them in a test tube to assemble into structures that look like the outer structure of the virus. Now, he didn't actually look to see the vaccine potential of this in terms of whether they induce neutralizing antibodies. But a few years later, back in 19, published in 1991, um, Neil Young, was looking at, at inducing a vaccine against parvovirus B19. And what he found is that if he expressed the major capsid protein in a baclovirus expre expression system, which produces a lot of protein, he got structures that looked like the virus. But what was interesting is when he, when he this was VP2, and when, when he put them in animals, like a rabbit, and took out the antibodies, it didn't prevent infection. So in that case, what he did is then he added the minor capsid protein. If you have both the major and the minor capsid protein, he was actually able to show that these virus-like particles induced high titers of antibodies that prevented infection by B19 pyrovirus in, in tissue culture. And so this sort of provided a roadmap of the kind of thing that we could hopefully do for papillomaviruses. Now the problem with papillomaviruses is we weren't sure that this was going to work by making these, expressing these in tissue culture cells because normally the virion proteins are only made in terminally differentiated cells. 
And one could have argued that maybe in terminally differentiated cells there are special chaperones that can lead to assembly of these major capsid proteins or the major and the minor capsid protein together that aren't found in cells that are replicating. And so there's a bunch, there's other things that we could put in, you know, as, as intellectual roadblocks from this working, but we thought, well, let's go ahead and do it. And so we got a new postdoc in whose name was Reinhard Kierenbauer, who, if anything, had less experience in this area than, than, than we had, because he was a board certified dermatologist and, and came to our lab basically to learn molecular biology and papillomavirus virology. And we said, Reinhardt, let's, we'll put you on two projects, but one of the projects is going to be, you're going to try to make these virus-like particles from, from HPV. And if it doesn't work, you can still have your other project. I forget what it was. Probably something to do with EGF receptors and ORC formation or something. He said, well, you can always do your other project. But suffice it to say, we, we thought, well, B19 baclovirus worked. Let's express L1 in baclovirus infected insect cells. The other reason for doing that is because baclovirus derived protein products have been approved for clinical trials by the FDA. It also produces large amounts and actually we got large amounts of production of in, in these insect cells that were infected by the recombinant baclovirus and lo and behold when we looked inside the cells by microscopy, electron microscopy, we saw these beautiful virus-like particles which we were able to purify um, and we found initially in a, in a bovine papillomavirus model that they induce high titers of virus neutralizing antibodies and since they were non-infectious and non-oncogenic they, they, be, they formed the, the basis of an attractive vaccine candidate and this is the paper that shows this and what's shown here are bovine papillomavirus virus L1 virus like pro protein uh, particles so in this case L1 alone was, was sufficient to induce assembly if you express L2 with it, you got co-assembly. But some of you might be asking, why did you do bovine papillomavirus first? Because the purpose of this exercise is not to prevent cow warts. Why didn't you do HPV first? And the answer is there was no assay to measure whether the antibodies made against an HPV VLP induced the type of antibodies that could prevent infection. There was no in vitro neutralization assays. But there was for BPV. Doug Lowy had actually developed one, essentially, in the lab just before I arrived. And so basically, this, the, if you take BPV and put it on mouse fibroblasts, you get what's called cellular transformation. And they, they pile up into these areas. So each one of these is called a transformed foci. And they indicate a single infectious event in this monolayer without the virus, you get nothing. If you treat it with antibodies where the rabbit got extracts from uninfected baclovirus cells, insect cells, you can see that you get the same number of infectious events. But if you start to titrate, um, so pre-immune was a rabbit that, that got the VLPs, um, be, but before he got vaccinated or she got vaccinated, now you can see as you titrate this down, you can see that up until about 100,000, you get about 50% neutralization. So this was completely remarkable. We actually, when Reinhardt first, these assays take about a month, by the way, to get these piled up areas. And so when Reinhardt did the first assay, we said dilute it 100 fold, because there's no way we're gonna have titers over 100, okay? And then he did, and then, so after a month, at 100, there was no foci whatsoever, complete blocking of infection. So he said, okay, we'll do it at 100,000. And at 100,000, we still got good blocking of infection. So up until he diluted a million fold in the third assay, after three months, could we, we could have an endpoint titer of about 100,000. And so this is basically unheard of for, for viral neutralizing antibodies. So we very quickly realized that these particles were really immunogenic. Not only do they generate a lot of antibodies, but the antibodies are really good at preventing infection. So, Having done for BPV, we are at the same time, because we did want to prevent infection by HPV-16, we then were making, in parallel, VLPs, L1 and L1 VLPs um, for HPV-16. And this is where we ran into a real problem, because we could barely detect any particles at all in the same system with HPV-16. The assembly efficiency was at least a thousand fold lower and you needed to have L2 to, to really get anything. 
So why was so, so then we started to grapple with the situation. Why was it that 16 didn't work and BPV worked? One possibility was that it's a difference in the types of tissues that these viruses infect. So BPV infects cutaneous skin, whereas HPV is, is a mucosal type. And so maybe the cutaneous types were just more robust in assembly and we weren't going to be able to get assembly of the mucosal types in this tissue culture system. Well, one of the reasons we thought this was unlikely is at the same time we were making VLPs of a, of a monkey model for HPV-16. It's called rhesus papillomavirus. And rhesus papillomavirus is very closely related to 16. It's more closely related to HPV-16 than HPV-18 is related to HPV-16. And what we found in parallel is that rhesus papillomavirus, which is also a mucosal type, made beautiful papillomavirus-like particles. And so we thought that it probably didn't have to do with the difference in tropism. And so then we thought, well, maybe this prototype L1 that everybody was using that Harold Zerhausen had identified was a mutant. Now, why would it be a mutant? Well, because this prototype, HPV-16, was isolated from a cancer, a cervical cancer. And as we know, cancers are what? Genetically unstable. And so this seemed like a real possibility that maybe it had acquired a serotypic mutant that we just didn't, wasn't aware of. And so the, the solution would then be to try to get clones, L1 clones, from productive lesions where the virus was actually making virions because they would be more likely to be wild type. And when we did this, the outcome was that two wild type clones assembled into VLPs just as well as BPV. And this shows the HPV-16, two a wild type strain, VLPs from L1 or L1, L2. We also made ones from other HPV types, for instance, 6 and 11. But when we went to the HPV and sequenced them, and we looked at the difference in the wild type and the prototype, we found that there was one critical mutation, that amino acid 202 in all the wild type strains we looked at, and actually most of the other HPVs, it was an aspartate, but it had been mutated to the a histidine. In one of the clones, that was the only difference was this change in histidine. And so that accounted for it. And why this was important is because later on, Richard Roden, who was sitting right here, when he was working in my lab, um, developed an in vitro neutralization assay so we could actually then look for whether antibodies generated against these various types of HPV-16L1 were neutralizing, could prevent infection or not. And what we found, what he found, was that the wild type L1 VLPs induce sky high titers of neutralizing antibodies, just like BPV, but the prototype L1 didn't induce any neutralizing antibodies. So it was critical that we move on, um, when we think about clinical trials, that we use the prototype rather than, uh, we don't use the prototype, but use the wild type strains. So th this discovery of the virus like particles inducing high titers of antibodies that prevent infection of tissue culture cells then led to a series of animals where we made, we and other people made VLPs of animal papillomavirus types and see, to see whether they would protect against experimental challenge of the corresponding animal papillomavirus. And you can see that this was done in, in the mid 90s um, in, in a, a dog model, the rabbit model, the same model initially that Shope had developed and also in BPV4, the model where the, these lesions can go on to cancer in the presence of vacuum And in each case, it was found that VLP vaccination induces very strong protection from experimental challenge. So this is about all we could do in animals, and the next thing to do was really to go on and to do this in people. And so now we were faced with a dilemma. What do we do to move this into a clinical trial? Two possibilities. One is we try to convince a pharmaceutical company that makes vaccines to take up this project, spend their money, and use their expertise to do this. And this, this was a very attractive um, plan because if we did it ourselves, there wouldn't be a product at the end of the, of the day that could be sold to people to prevent cervical cancer. And so we actually solicited a whole lot of different companies to do this. And most companies said, we really like your data. I can't think of any more data we'd like to see. This is great. 
but we're not interested. <laughs> and the reason they weren't interested is because nobody believed that vaccines against sexually transmitted diseases could work. And at the time, this was a, re a reasonable hypothesis because they hadn't worked despite quite a bit of effort in HIV, chlamydia, herpes, various other types of vaccines. And to this day, the only sexually transmitted disease vaccine works is HPV. So this was a rational decision, okay? And, and the reason that people usually gave was that, you know, sexually transmitted diseases aren't like the flu or measles where someone coughs on you occasionally and then you're not exposed very often. If you have a partner with a persistent in sexually transmitted disease, you're going to get constant exposure, re-exposure to the virus, and sooner or later you're going to get a breakthrough infection. It was, they couldn't envision that you could get long-term sterilizing immunity. And if all that it did is prevented infection, from a public health point of view, it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference if a woman got cervical cancer when she's 50 years old in six months versus when she was 50 years old, okay? So, but two companies took a leap of faith to move forward, and that was Merck and GSK, and they developed HPV vaccines, and I'll show you in a minute. But now the question was, if, if there's these two companies going to move forward, should we also move forward in the public sector? And we went back and forth about this, um, and eventually we decided that, yeah, it was worthwhile to do a public sector trial sponsored by the NCI. And the main reason for this was twofold. One is that companies pulled the plug for a lot of various reasons. And we thought that this was important enough to follow through to the end with at least one efficacy trial to see how it works to prevent HPV inf infection by the oncogenic types. And the other thing is that we would be asking questions and in, in, in collecting data that the companies just wouldn't be interested in, wouldn't be doing, because their job was to get FDA approval for these vaccines as quickly as possible. And so they would only be addressing the issues that the FDA absolutely required for licensure. And I'll give you an example later where we looked at something that, that the companies didn't, that we think is, is going to be the key to future implementation of the vaccine. So basically we decided at the NCI to do independent trials. And the phase one and two trials here were done by, in collaboration with an extremely good group at the Johns Hopkins Center for Immunization Re Research, the late um, Clayton Harrell and also Ruth Karen. And basically what we found is that these vaccines were very safe and very highly immunogenic, just like they were in the animal models. People were telling us, well, you know, you can get a high titers in mice and animals, but people, you couldn't get that sort of thing. For this vaccine, people are mice. They respond just as strongly as a mouse in terms of virus-like particle. And we even got good responses even in the absence of adjuvant, although at higher doses, at lower doses, there was some dose sparing with the presence of adjuvant. And then get, based upon that, we then went on to a clinical trial, uh, an efficacy trial down in Costa Rica with Costa Rican colleagues. Now, the first report of efficacy of this vaccine wasn't done by us. We had the first report of a phase one, phase two trial of safety and immunogenicity. But the first report that this vaccine could work, a really exciting report, came from a monovalent HPV vaccine trial that was sponsored by Merck. And I still remember being at the HPV pap or the papillomavirus meeting down in Forolopolis, Brazil, and I was up here as a moderator of the session. And Laura Kautsky, who was from the University of Seattle, who was the lead in conducting this trial, came up kind of unexpectedly and says, I'm going to present the, the results of this trial, which was the first efficacy trial of an HPV vaccine. And what you can see down here is that the score between control and vaccines was 41 to 0 in terms of the number of, of persistent HPV infections that were observed in this trial. So I'm not a statistician, but you know that looked, that looked pretty good to me. And this was at the moment when I really thought this vaccine was going to work. Because before then, we still we had no idea whether they would really um, prevent sexually transmitted disease because none of the animal models involved sexual transmission, OK? They were always scarifying the skin and putting a virus in there. So this was really the, 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 the nodal point where we really thought that this vaccine would work. So this eventually led to the development and commercialization of three different vaccines. So Cervarex, which was made by GSK, is a bivalent vaccine, and it contains a special adjuvant called ASO4, which is, ha, contains a TLR4 agonist 
uh, monophosphorolipid A. Uh, it's the first time this type of adjuvant has been approved for a prophylactic vaccine. And, it, and it's made in the same production system that we initially showed. Um, Merck has made two vaccines, Gardasil, which contains 16 and 18, the types that cause 70% of cervical cancer, and 6 and 11, which cause 90% of genital warts, but not cancer. And they make it in yeast, um, which is where they, they make their hepatitis B vaccine, which preceded it. And more recently, Gardasil 9 has been introduced, which, can, in addition to the types in Gardasil, contain the next five types found in cancer. And this is the vaccine you're pretty much going to get if you, if you use it in the United States now. And it contains a simple aluminum salts adjuvant. And it just was fairly recently licensed. So this vaccine has pretty much ex exceeded expectations, even the most optimistic expectations all along. When we first made the virus-like particles, it turned out it was really easy. They made really tons of neutralizing antibodies. And if you look at protection in these studies from the most cancer proximal endpoint that we can have, which is high-grade cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, grade three, you can see, and you limit the analysis to women, to the types caused by the vaccine, infections caused by the types targeted by the vaccine, and that aren't infected at the time that we vaccinate them. In other words, looking at prophylaxis, prevention, not treatment, you can see that both vaccines are 100% protection under those conditions. They don't allow women to get high-grade precancers if they're vaccinated by the types targeted. And you can see that, that Cervarex, which targeted genital warts, isn't too bad against genital warts as well. And so this shows a timeline to conclude of what I've been talking about. And what it shows is that if, if you want to make an impact in public health, you have to really talk about a fairly long, long timeline. So the crucial um, aspects were really in parallel starting with the discovery of HPV 16 and 18 and the eventual decision that HPVs were a necessary cause of cervical cancer in, 2000, in 1999, coupled with the development of the virus-like particle um, technology and testing with the first efficacy results actually occurring um, shortly after HPV was a necessary cause and the first HPV DNA test approved in 2002 leading to licensure in 2006. And to show you, I mean, so for me, this has actually been a very, very gratifying and um, exciting personal journey to sort of be involved with all this, to see this at the second lecture I went to, and to see this at the end. But it's even more gratifying because if you look at it, the, all this development paralleled the development of my daughter. So this little Buddha baby, baby that you see on the left, that's my daughter when we first made the discovery about HPV. And it just so t happens that she was the first cohort to be vaccinated. She turned 13 just when the first vaccine was developed. So in addition to being gratifying from the point of view of a scientist, it's also been very gratifying from the point of view of a parent. So where are we now? Well, recently it was, it was estimated that if we don't have this vaccine, there's going to be 19 million cases of, cancer, of cervical cancer and 10 million deaths over the last 65 years. How much of a dent have we done by vaccination? Well, it's been estimated again that we've, we've prevented about 360,000 cases of cancer and 150,000 cases of, 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 of deaths from cervical cancer. Now you can look at this as a really positive thing. If you had a cancer treatment and you said, okay, we just cured 150,000 people of cancer, you'd be jumping up and down and saying, wow, this is really amazing. But cancer prevention, it shows is, is silent, okay? The women who are protected from this don't know that they've been protected from it. So it can be undervalued. And the other dark cloud is that we could do so much better. There's so many of these women that we could prevent cancer from that we're not doing, and especially in the developing world where we've almost made no dent on cervical cancer because they're not being vaccinated. The cohorts that have been vaccinated are shown in the stripes. And so we need to increase uptake, particularly in low resource settings. Um, fortunately, Gavi, which distributes its vaccine to, in, to the 72 lowest income countries, is able to buy the vaccine for $5 a dose, which is much less than the almost $200 a dose we pay for in the United States. 
We're working with companies in emerging uh, companies in emerging countries like um, China and India to, the, to manufacture the vaccine for low cost distribution in low resource settings. We have to address vaccine hesitancy by edu educating, developing good education programs that aim both at families and healthcare providers. And this seems to be a special problem in places like the United States, maybe less of a problem in, in, in low resource settings. Then finally, I don't have time to talk about it, but we really think the future of this vaccine is a single dose. And in our, our cost to recon trial, we looked at the women who only had one dose, and we continue to follow them. And so far, out to 10 years, nobody who got a single dose has an HPV 16 or 18 infection. There's no difference between protection between women getting one, two, or three doses. Companies didn't look at this because it wasn't, wasn't on the causal pathway to licensure. And so, but the, this was post hoc analysis. And so right now, we're, we're, we've just initiated what I think is a very exciting study to look whether one or two doses of Cervex or Gardasil 9 can pr pr protect in a randomized trial from persistent infection. Because if it does, and we can go down to one dose, I think this can do more than anything else to raise those numbers and so that we, we can actually make a more sizable dent in the rates of cervical cancer. The other, the other um, policy that that's people are talking about is to make a faster impact by doing what's called HPV faster where in addition to vaccinating adolescents or pre-adolescents, what we would do is we would take women in, in their, someplace in their 30s and call them in and screen them once, probably by a DNA-based test. If they're positive, you would treat them. This is where we need to really get an HPV vaccine. TC, where you, this, is, this is on you, buddy. We need, really need to have a therapeutic vaccine for HPV to use at this point. Um, and then, so we immediately treat them if possible, and then vaccinate them probably with one dose so that you now protect them in the future from any new HPV infections. So hopefully what I've convinced you is that we are moving towards, and we have the tools for eliminating cervical cancer, maybe not in my lifetime, but hopefully in some of your lifetimes. And rather than make the case myself, I would like to close by making the case that was made just a few months ago by the Secretary General of the World Health Organization. And what he said was that cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer. Prevention and early treatment are also highly cost effective. HPV vaccines are truly wondrous inventions if only we had vaccines against every form of cancer. True. So the challenge is to ensure that all girls globally are vaccinated against HPV and that every woman over 30 is screened <coughs> and treated for precancerous lesions. If we could achieve this, we could eliminate cervical cancer. So thank you. Sorry, I took a little maybe I took a little bit longer. So if you want to stay for questions, stay for questions, but I realize that some of you have got to go. It would be possible, but, but the eradication is formally possible. Yes, is, is it possible to actually eradicate right, 16 and 18 off the face of the earth like we did smallpox? And it's possible because there's no animal reservoir. But we would have to, to either get to much more than 80%, which would be enough for, for elimination. And we'd have to get pockets you know, way back in the woods and everything. I think it's going to be, I, I, I don't have that goal. So it's, the question is about vaccinating men and women. So in the in, in, um, United States, we vaccinate both men and women, um, or boys and girls, I should say. There is, there is strong herd immunity in, in men in terms of getting pre prevention of genital warts in women-only vaccination program. This has been shown in, in Australia. But it, it doesn't reach MSMs, okay, which is one of the issues. And obviously, if you vaccinate both sexes, you're going to develop herd immunity more rapidly. 
especially in countries like the United States, where we only have about 50% vaccination rates. Um, vaccinating boys will help us protect women against cervical cancer, as well as the cancers that they get, oral pharyngeal cancer, anal cancer, and penile cancer. So it really depends upon the, the, the amount of money, the resources you can devote to this program. If you don't have a lot of money, it's better to concentrate on girls. If you don't have enough money to offer the vaccine to every young girl, young woman in your country, you shouldn't be, my, my feeling is you shouldn't be vaccinating boys. If you can do that, then the next thing to do is to start vaccinating boys. Yeah. I just had a question about, so uh, about HPV latency as it, in, with regard to the HPV vaccine, right? So you use the term clear, but a lot of the data is sort of showing that HPV can be a latent virus. And some of the post hoc analyses sort of have shown that women um, who really did have a pre existing infection, or even the small um, study that had been done looking at vaccination at the time of treatment, right, are showing sort of positive results. And so I think that was surprising to sort of all of us who. Um, So, my feeling is, it, it, first of all, I'm not, when you said high risk, I'm not sure that they're at high risk. They're, they're at some risk. Um, and I think there's a certain amount of misclassification, especially when you use serology. These women have low level serology responses. It's not clear to me whether that really means, for instance, they, they really were infected with 16 and now are susceptible or whether they were misclassified. And they maybe had another infection with a certain amount of cross-reactivity that doesn't, that doesn't involve neutralizing antibodies. Um, and again, it, vaccinating older women just becomes less and less bang for the buck. And again, it's, it's how much money you can spend. If, 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 if healthcare is a zero-sum game, is it worthwhile vaccinating a 40-year-old, especially with multiple doses? I mean, three doses would be very expensive. Um, when the chances of her acquiring a, fact, a new, say, 16 infection, not having been pre previously exposed and immune, and then having that infection go on to cancer before she dies of something else, you, the bang for the buck becomes quite small. So again, it's, it's hard for me to, to say because I don't know what the opportunity costs, what, what is this being played against? I would rather spend the money trying to guarantee that old people uh, get flu vaccines, for instance, okay? So it's hard for me to judge. Would it do some good? Yes. Is it worth the money? It's questionable. Okay. Okay. Yes. What is the mechanism by which HPV inhibits TPCP or TRB and allows non-TPCP? Yeah. So it's 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 well. This has been worked out very well. So so P53 it actually induces the ubiquitin-dependent degradation of P53. So it binds to a protein, it's called E6AP, which is, is ubiquitin ligase that then ubiquitinates P53 and then leads to the de degradation of P53. Um, and this is an activity of the oncogenic types, but not the non-oncogenic types. I, for, I forgot to mention that. Um, so it does seem to be associated with cancer. And for, for PRB, it can bind and just inactivate it by binding, but also it can induce um, degradation as well. The levels of PRB go down. It, it preferentially binds, I think, the phosphorylated form. So E7 actually physically binds PRB. Okay, thanks.